Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Satterfield, and thanks to all of you for coming out. It's really a great privilege and an honor to be back at uh, uh, Villanova. Uh, it's a special treat for me to be uh, visiting the institution where my beloved former student, uh, Daniel Mark, is a member of the uh, faculty and teaching here the very courses he took with me uh, when he was at Princeton, and I'm extremely proud of him. Uh, so again, thank you, Dr. Satterfield. Thank you to the McAndrews family uh, for sponsoring this uh, lecture. Uh, thank you to the Matthew Ryan Center, who, which does so much important work on this campus, and I'm always happy to help in any way I can. And of course, uh, to my friends and colleagues at the American Enterprise uh, Institute. This is going to be a dry and long lecture. So settle in, set your alarm clocks. Those of us who are citizens of democratic republics don't refer to the people who govern us as rulers, do we? We don't refer to them as our rulers. No, it is our boast, rather, that they are servants. We rule ourselves. They serve us. Now, this concept of self-rule, government not only of the people, which all government is, not only for the people, which all good government is, even the government of benign despot, but government by the people, republican government. There's truth in the idea that in a republican regime, the people are their own rulers, and the people who occupy the positions of government are public servants. But of course, these servants are nothing like the servants in Downton Abbey. Did some of you watch Downton Abbey? Yeah. The extraordinary prestige and usually the trappings attaching to public office in just about all times and in all places, including in republics, would by themselves be sufficient to distinguish, say, the mayor of Philadelphia or the governor of Pennsylvania or certainly the president of the United States from Carson the butler. But that prestige signals an underlying fact that discomfits our democratic and egalitarian sensibilities, namely the fact that even in liberal democratic regimes in modern republics, high officials rule. They are rulers. They make the rules. They enforce the rules. They resolve disputes about the meaning and applicability of the rules. To a very, very, very large extent, at the end of the day, what they say goes. So we may call them servants all day long, but they still rule. But it's also fair to say that our rulers in democracies or republics, as, we, as our founders preferred, rule not by dint of sheer power the way the mafia might uh, rule in a territory over which it happens to have gained control, but rather our rulers rule lawfully. Constitutional rules specify public offices and settle the procedures for filling them. Whether the Constitution exists in the form of a written document, such as the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of California or West Virginia, or in some other form, as in the United Kingdom or New Zealand, but they're unwritten constitutions. Either way, the written or unwritten constitution constitutes, in a sense, the set of rules governing the rulers, rules that both empower office holders to make and execute decisions of various sorts and limit, limits their powers. So though they are indeed rulers, they are not absolute rulers. Constitutional rules set the scope and thus the limits of their jurisdiction and authority. They are rulers who are subject to rules, rules they themselves do not make and cannot easily or purely on their own initiative revise or repeal. They rule in limited ways and ordinarily for limited terms, which may or may not be indefinitely renewable at the pleasure of the voters. They rule by virtue of democratic processes by which they come to hold office. They can be removed or significantly disempowered at the next election if the people are unhappy with them. Still, they rule. 
Now, my point this evening is not to hoot at the idea of government and those holding governmental offices and controlling the levers of governmental power as servants. Not at all. Actually, I want in the end to defend that idea, the idea that rulers truly can be servants. I want to establish, however, that if the people we call public servants are indeed servants, they're servants in a very special sense, a sense that is compatible with them at the same time being rulers. They are people who serve us by ruling. They serve us well by ruling well. If they rule badly, they serve us poorly. Indeed, they disserve us. Now, there are, of course, lots of ways that rulers can disserve those whom they have the moral obligation to serve by ruling well. Most obviously, there is incompetence. You have that at all times, at all places, with all forms of government, including liberal, democratic, or republican government. Then, of course, there is corruption. And at the extreme, there is tyranny. So what does it mean for the ruler to truly be a servant? What does it mean for someone holding political office and exercising public power to rule well? Well, at the most general level, formally, it means making and executing decisions for the sake of the common good. That is not the good of the ruler's tribe or clan or family or group or party, not in his own self-interest. Rather, ruling for the sake of the common welfare, not the partisan interest, not the tribal interest. Such decisions will necessarily, if they're for the common good, be compatible with the requirements of justice and at the same time embody justice. If we understand the concept of the common good properly, and I'm going to say more about it later in this lecture, then we will see that no decision that violates a requirement of justice is truly for the common good. And no decision that genuinely upholds and serves the common good will fail to advance the cause of justice, considered precisely as giving to each his due. Now, it's important to note that decisions can fail to serve the common good and can indeed damage the common good even when they are not unjust. Even honorably motivated and well-intentioned people, including rulers, can make decisions that harm the common good because they are inexpedient, imprudent, or unwise. Holders of public office like anyone else, even those with the noblest of intentions, even the good guys can make poor, even disastrous decisions. Poor decisions by well-intentioned public officials can trigger or prolong a Great Depression. They can lead a nation into an unnecessary and even disastrous war or prevent a nation from going to war to protect its people and their vital interests when it should have done or undermine or weaken valuable social institutions. So it's worth adding here that reasonable people of goodwill can, and obviously do, disagree about what the common good requires and forbids. That is, what is in fact, in truth, just and unjust. The debate is not, or at least is not exclusively, between the good people and the bad people. The good people can divide over questions of what the common good requires, even questions about justice, human rights, human dignity. Honorable people exercising public power can commit injustices, even grave injustices, while seeking in good faith to do justice and believing in good faith that they are doing it. So just as not all violations of the common good are injustices, not all injustices are the result of malice or ill will or prejudice or like vices. Still, all injustices, even if committed by officials who are sincerely trying to do the right thing, harm the common good. 
For justice itself is a common good, that is, is a good for everyone in the community. It's good for everyone in the community to live in a community that is just. And harm to that public order, to the common good, is therefore a loss to everyone and not merely to the immediate and obvious victims of any particular injustice. Indeed, it's even a harm, a loss, for the ostensible beneficiaries of injustices and even for the perpetrators of injustice, though naturally true evildoers, the real bad guys, don't see it that way. Corruption of character narrows their vision of the good, blinding them to the profound respects in which wrongdoing harms what is in truth their interest in living in a just society, as well as everyone else's. Now, the common good requires that there be rulers. As Martin Luther King pointed out, but it's obvious you shouldn't need an authority to point it out, the worst situation you can imagine is anarchy. The strong will simply prey on the weak. So the common good requires, justice requires, that there be rulers and that they rule. To grasp this is to begin to see the sense in which good rulers are also servants. Members of a society, any society, any complex society, certainly any modern society, face a range, sometimes a vast range, of challenges and opportunities requiring all sorts of schemes of coordination, including in the case of really complex societies like ours, what philosophers of law call coordination problems, presented by the large number and the complexity of other problems in the society. The, the simplest example is somebody's got to come up with a scheme of traffic regulation if you're going to have cars or even horse-driven carriages. You know, if you don't have a scheme of traffic coordination, then the best people in the world wanting to do no harm to each other, just wanting to get from place to place, are going to crash into each other. They're going to end up with traffic jams. They're going to hurt pedestrians, not because people are bad, but because you lack a scheme of traffic coordination. And since problems, even a simple one like traffic coordination, cannot as a practical matter be addressed and resolved by unanimity, authority, political authority, is required. This is a subject on which uh, Professor Mark is making an important contribution. Institutions will have to be created and maintained, and persons will need to be installed in the offices of those institutions to make the choices and decisions that must be made and to do the things that need to be done for the sake of protecting public health, safety, and morals, upholding the rights and dignity of individuals, families, and non-governmental entities of various descriptions, and advancing the overall common good. And this would be true even in a society of perfect saints, a society where no one ever sought more than his fair share from the common stock or violated the rights of others or deliberately acted in any manner that was contrary to the common good. Even in such a society, effective coordination, planning, would be required. And seeking unanimity, assuming a large and fairly complex society like ours, would not be a practical option. So authority is required, and that means people exercising authority. Rulers <clears throat> ruling. But the moral justification for the ruler's ruling is precisely service to the common good, the good of all. And the common good is not just some abstraction out there. It's not some platonic form hovering out there in the transcendent realms. No, the common good is just the good, the shared goods of flesh and blood human beings, people like you and me, our flourishing as individuals, as members of families and other small communities, as fellow citizens. It just is, it being the common good, just is the well-being of those persons and communities. Burke's little platoons, the communities of civil society of which we are members. So the right of legitimate rulers to rule is rooted in the duty of rulers to rule in the interest of all. In other words, the basis of the right to rule is the duty 
to serve. What's foundational is not the right of rulers to rule. What's foundational is the duty to serve. The right to rule is derivative of the duty to serve. And the realities that constitute the content of service are the various elements of the common good. By doing what is for the common good and by avoiding doing what harms the common good, rulers fulfill their obligations to the people over whom they exercise authority, thus serving their interests, the people's interests, their welfare, their flourishing, in a word, serving them. Now, I don't know how to improve on the definition of the common good proposed by my own uh, graduate supervisor, Professor John Finnis of Oxford University, in his magisterial 1980 book, Natural Law and Natural Rights. Here's Finnis's conception, one might say definition, of the common good. It is, Finnis says, and I quote, a set of conditions which enables the members of a community to attain for themselves reasonable objectives or to realize reasonably for themselves the value or values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other positively and negatively in a community. By positively, means Finnis means cooperating together for a common end. By negatively, he means cooperating to stay out of each other's way, unquote. Now, every community from the basic community of a family to a church or other community of religious faith to a mutual aid society or other civic association to a business firm will have a common good. The, the common good consisting of the reasons that they have, the goods to be attained by their collaboration and cooperation. The common good of some communities is fundamentally an intrinsic rather than an instrumental good. That's true, for example, of the community of the family. Although families serve many valuable and some indispensable instrumental purposes, the point of the family, of being a family, of being a member of a family, is not exhausted by those instrumental purposes, nor do they define what a family is. The most fundamental point of being a member of a family is simply being a member of a family, enjoying the intrinsic benefit of being part of that distinctive network of mutual obligation, care, love, and support. The same is true, at least in Christian and Jewish thought, of the common good of communities of faith. Though communities of faith characteristically serve many valuable instrumental purposes, they run rehab centers and soup kitchens, and they do collections for the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and they do all sorts of good works for the community, and they provide talks for the members of the, of the parish or the members of the synagogue community or the members of the mosque and religious education. The most fundamental purpose of Israel or of the church is to be the people of God. It's good to run the St. Vincent de Paul Society. It's good to run the soup kitchen. Those are expressions of the faith. They're outgrowths of the faith. But they don't define what the faith is. Now, things are obviously different when it comes to, say, business firms. They, too, are communities. They're people collaborating together for reasons, for the sake of goods, ends, purposes, that give them reason to collaborate. And although there are very many opportunities for the principals and employees of companies or even small businesses to realize intrinsic or basic human goods, including goods that are fundamentally social, such as the good of friendship, and being kind to each other and doing their work together and so forth, um, still, the fundamental purpose of the business, of the firm, of the shop, of the company, is to provide the good or the service to make a profit for the owner or owners or shareholders or what have you. So the fundamental, in the most fundamental sense, the common good of the business firm, unlike the common good of the family or the common good of the religious community, is an instrumental good, not an intrinsic good. And that takes us to the obvious question. Well, what about the political community? Is the political community's common good fundamentally an intrinsic good, like the good of the family and the good of the religious community? Or is it an instrumental good, like the good of the business firm? 
Well, there is in what the late Sir Isaiah Berlin referred to as the central tradition of Western thought about morality, including political morality, a powerful current of belief that the common good of political society is indeed an intrinsic good. This seems pretty clearly to have been the view of Aristotle. And many self-identified Thomists are firmly convinced that it was the view of Aristotle's greatest interpreter and expositor, namely St. Thomas Aquinas. Professor Finnis, however, argues that the common good of political society, though, to quote Aristotle, great and godlike in the range and important in its range and importance, is nevertheless fundamentally an instrumental and not an intrinsic good, more like a business than like a family. And Professor Finnis further argues that the instrumental nature of the common good of political society entails limitations of the legitimate scope of governmental power. Limitations that, though not in every case easily articulable in the language of rights, are nevertheless requirements of justice. Limited government follows from the instrumental nature, fundamentally instrumental nature, of the common good of the political community. Now, although I myself have a difference at the margins with Professor Finnis, uh, on the question of just what those limits are, and in particular whether they exclude in principle moral paternalism. I agree with him that the common good of political society is fundamentally an instrumental good, and that that does indeed entail moral limits on justified governmental power. The way we've come to think of those limits, at least since the 19th uh, century, is in terms of what is sometimes called the doctrine of subsidiarity. Now, I, I'd just be curious uh, whether this concept or that word is entirely foreign to people. When I say the doctrine of subsidiarity, uh, anybody have some idea of what I'm talking about? Has anybody studied? So some, a few have, uh, most haven't. So let me explain. Well, in fact, let me let uh, uh, a pope who was pope 90 years ago, Pope Pius XI, explained because he gives us a wonderful explanation in uh, the 1931 encyclical called Quadragesimo Anno. And here's what he said. This is the doctrine of subsidiarity in a nutshell. Quote, just as it is wrong to withdraw from the individual and commit to a group what private initiative and effort can accomplish, so too it is wrong for a larger and higher association to arrogate to itself functions that can be performed efficiently by smaller and lower associations. This is a fixed, unchanged, and most weighty principle of moral philosophy. Of its very nature, the true aim of all social activities should be to help members of a social body and not to absorb or destroy them. So the point of a community is to serve the good of the individual members of the community. It is not to absorb the members into the collectivity. This is the principle that stands against, for example, Mao's dictum that to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Now, this principle of justice, subsidiarity, and the common good reflects a particular understanding of the nature and content of human flourishing, what it means for us human beings to do well, to flourish. Flourishing consists, as Aristotle taught, in doing things, not just in getting things or having desirable or pleasant experiences, which many people seem to think today, or having things done for you, as opposed to doing stuff. The good, as Aristotle taught, consists in activity. Human goods are realized by acting. One participates in them, thus enriching one's life and even ennobling oneself, as one exercises and fulfills one's natural human capacities. For example, one's capacities for friendship, or the pursuit of intellectual knowledge, or, uh, or uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic appreciation, the appreciation of critical, a beautiful form, for example art, music. And so the common good is, as Finnis's definition, which I quoted a moment ago, makes clear, best conceived as a set of conditions, not as a set of outcomes. But we must ask conditions for what? Well, 
conditions for enabling members of a community to attain for themselves reasonable objectives or to realize reasonably for themselves the values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other in community. Stuff that you can accomplish together that you can't accomplish individually. Or stuff that you can accomplish better or more fully or more richly together than you can individually. So the common good is in this sense, it seems to me, facilitative. Its elements are what enable people to do things individually and in cooperation with others, the doing of which to a very significant degree constitutes their all-round or integral flourishing. Under favoring conditions, people can more fully and more successfully carry out reasonable projects, pursue reasonable objectives, and thus participate in values, including some values that are inherently social and that they <coughs> fulfill people in respect of capacities for non-instrumental forms of personal, uh, interpersonal communion, that are indeed constitutive of the well-being and fulfillment of ourselves as human beings. Properly understood, then, the common good requires, as a matter of justice, limited government. Government that respects the needs and rights of people to pursue objectives and realize goods for themselves. The fundamental role of legitimate government, and thus the responsibility of legitimate rulers, rulers who actually serve, is not to be doing things for people that they could do for themselves. It's rather to be helping to establish and maintain conditions that favor people's doing things for themselves and with and for each other. Government should do things for people as opposed to letting them do things for themselves. Only where individuals and non-governmental institutions of civil society cannot do them or cannot reasonably expected to do them for themselves. Finnish used the word enable, and it's the right word, I think, here. Government's legitimate concern is with the establishment and maintenance of conditions under which members of the community are enabled to pursue projects and goals by and through which they participate in the goods constitutive of their flourishing. Friendship, knowledge, ascetic appreciation, the practice of their faith, uh, the inculcation of virtue in their children, the practice of virtue in their own lives the pursuit of justice, and so forth. Now, this facilitative conception of the common good does not require a doctrinaire libertarianism, either in the domain of political economy or social morality. But it clearly excludes corporatist policies that, to recall those words from Pius XI, withdraw from the individual and commit to the group what private individual, and effort, uh, individual uh, effort can accomplish or which remove from the family or religious or civic association, the little platoons, and commit to government what can be accomplished by non-governmental collaborative effort, collaborative effort, by churches, by private associations. Now, surely a conception of the common good that is serious about the principle of subsidiarity will respect private property and take care to maintain a reasonably free system of economic exchange, that is to say, a market economy without treating either property or the market as an absolute. The comprehensive state ownership of the means of production is clearly incompatible with subsidiarity's concerns and objectives, as is anything command, uh, resembling a command economy. And this would be true even if the record of command economies were better than it is, especially when it comes to respect for civil liberties and political freedom. And it would be true, again, contrary to the historical record, even if private property and some measure of market exchange were not necessary as checks against the excessive concentration and abuse of power in the hands of public officials. And there's a profound lesson for this, of the, in this for those of us who are interested in ensuring that the rulers remain servants even as they rule, ruling in the interests of citizens and not in the interests of themselves, their tribe, their group, their party, their financial supporters, whoever. And that is, we have to be careful that we don't give those exercising public authority the power to reduce citizens to a state of dependency 
and therefore of servitude. For it's critical to the effective limitation of governmental power that there be substantial non-governmental centers of power in society. Private property and the market economy not only provide the conditions of social mobility, which is important to the common good in any modern or dynamic society, but also ensure that there are significant resources and thus opportunities for people and the private associations they form that are not in the direct control of government officials or the apparatus of the state. In other words, the diffusion of power benefits society as a whole and not only those who most immediately benefit economically from the possession of property or the ability to profit in the market. And I'm not simply here talking about general prosperity, though that is yet another benefit of a private, of a private property system and a market economy. I'm talking about the benefit to all in terms of liberty, opportunity, and security of the diffusion of power. Now, if uh, my friend and teaching partner Cornell West were here, he would say, OK, Robbie, yeah, I get that. I, you, it's a good point. But there's another side of that, and that is power can be concentrated in a way that damages the common good not only in governmental hands, but also in private hands. So monopoly and oligopoly can be just as damaging to the values I'm trying to protect as government control. And he's right about that. <clears throat> and there's a very interesting question about the role and obligation of government to ensure that oligopoly and monopoly do not result in the same damage to the common good that can result, or similar damage to the common good, damage similar to what we get if there's too great a governmental concentration of power. So again, this is not an argument for doctrinaire libertarianism or anything like that. But all of this goes beyond economics. If we understand the common good, if we grasp what constitutes or is conducive to the flourishing of human beings and what is not, will recognize that limited government is also important because it permits the functioning and flourishing of those non-governmental institutions of civil society. Again, those little platoons, the families, the churches, the civic associations, Little League and the Campfire Girls and 4-H and the Italian American Club and all of the institutions of civil society that perform better than government ever could hope to do the most essential health, education, and welfare functions, and which play in a way that government simply cannot the primary role in transmitting to each new generation, young people, children, the virtues without which free societies cannot survive. Basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for others and respect for their dignity and rights, civic mindedness, and the like. I mean, ask your, think of yourself. I mean, where did you learn basic honesty, integrity, concern about other people, compassion? The government teach you? Mayor of Philadelphia? Governor of Pennsylvania? President of the United States? No. It was mom, right? And dad, and grandma, and grandpa, and uncle, and auntie, and neighbor, and pastor, and coach, and teacher, and friend. These non-governmental authority structures, the little platoons, represent another crucial way in which power is properly diffused and not concentrated in the hands of the state and state officials. They can play their role only when government is limited. For unlimited government always usurps the authority, their authority, and destroys their autonomy, there being the autonomy of the institutions of civil society, usually recruiting or commandeering them into being state functionary organs. And where they're playing their proper role, those institutions of civil society, they help to create the conditions in which the ideal of limited government is much more likely to be realized and preserved and its benefits enjoyed by the people. When you get the breakdown of civil society, and we know places in our own country where this has happened, and we certainly know from historical experience places where this has happened, where civil society fails to function, where it breaks down, it's not as if no authority exists and anarchy reigns. That might happen for a while, but pretty soon government is going to come in exercising authority. Somebody's got to do it. Government is all there is 
because civil society is broken down. Government will do it badly, but it'll do it. And it's the only alternative there. Now, I'll return to these institutions of civil society toward the end of my remarks, but now let me shift to the discussion the, the discussion to the question of constitutional structural restraints on the powers of government. Historically, political theorists have focused on the need for such constraints as the most obvious and important way to ensure that governmental power remains limited and that the rulers continue to be servants and don't become tyrants. And I myself think that the constraints of this nature, such as in our own constitution, our principles of separation of powers and federalism, for example, uh, I myself think they're really important, though I'm going to eventually get around to saying this evening that they are likely to be effective only when they are part of a larger picture in which they are supported by and in turn support other features of social life that help keep government within its proper bounds for the sake of the common good. So as important as they are, I would argue against, warn against, placing too great an emphasis on constitutional structural constraints. The danger there is in ignoring other essential features. It's just false to suppose that we can simply rely on constitutional structural restraints to make everything come out OK. They help. They're important. I'm usually the guy singing their praises, preaching them, saying Madison got it right. But they're not enough. And tonight's lecture is about they're not being enough. Now, the Constitution of the United States is famous for its Madisonian system of structural constraints on the power of the central government. What we're getting on now for 250 years of experience with this system gives us a pretty good idea of both its strengths, which are considerable, and its limitations, which do exist. The major structural constraints are, as I mentioned, the doctrine of the general government as a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers. Two, the dual sovereignty of the general government and the states, with the states functioning as governments of general jurisdiction, exercising generalized police powers, a kind of plenary authority, limited under the Constitution uh, uh, only by specific prohibitions or by grants of power to the general government in a federal union, federalism. And then three, the separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers within the national government, creating the so-called system of checks and balances that I, I hope you still learn about in high school. I hope high schools still teach about the separation of powers. And then fourth, the practice, though nowhere actually mentioned in the text of the Constitution, uh, but lay that aside for now, of constitutional judicial review by the federal courts. Now, I often ask my students at the beginning of my undergraduate course on civil liberties how the framers of the Constitution of the United States sought to preserve liberty and prevent tyranny. It is, alas, a testament to the poor quality of civic education in the United States that almost none of my students can answer that question correctly on the first day of class. Nor, I suspect, would most members of Congress actually be able to answer it correctly, or the editorial page writers for the major newspapers. The typical answer is this. Well, Professor, I can tell you how the framers of the Constitution sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny. They attached to the Constitution a Bill of Rights to protect the individual and minorities against the tyranny of the majority. And they vested the power to enforce those rights in the hands of judges who serve for life and are therefore not subject to election or recall and cannot be removed from office except on impeachment for serious misconduct and are therefore able to protect people's rights without fear of political retaliation. That's the answer I get. Now, in a way, I'm grateful for that answer because it does show that they've read the Constitution, uh, which is the first assignment. They're supposed to have read it before coming to class on the first day. And uh, they either learned there or they happen to know before that federal judges serve for life and they can only be removed on impeachment. They're not subject to recall. They're not subject to election. Still, the answer is as wrong as it can be. But it's widely believed, and not just by university students. None of the American founders, even among those who favored judicial review and regarded it as implicit in the Constitution, which by no means all did, believed that it was the central, or even a very significant, constraint on the power of the national government. 
nor did they believe that the enforcement of the Bill of Rights guarantees by courts would be an important way of protecting liberty. The Federalists, in the original sense of those who supported the proposed Constitution, which would revise, really replace, the um, Articles of Confederation, the Federalists generally opposed, opposed, you heard me right, opposed the addition of a Bill of Rights. Hamilton opposed it. Originally, Madison opposed it. Almost all of the Federalists opposed it, which is why it wasn't in the Constitution, why it exists as a set of amendments rather than part of the Constitution as originally ratified. And they opposed it because they feared that the addition of a Bill of Rights or inclusion of a Bill of Rights would actually undermine what they regarded as the main structural constraints protecting freedom and preventing tyranny, namely the conception and public understanding of the general government, not as a government of general jurisdiction, exercising plenary or police powers, but as a government of delegated and enumerated powers, specifically limited to the powers given. And two, the division of powers between the national government and the states in a system of dual sovereignty. When a political necessity, when political necessity forced the Federalists to yield to demands for a Bill of Rights in the form of the first eight amendments to the Constitution, they took care, our founding fathers took care, to add two more amendments. After the first eight, you get nine and 10. And those are designed to reinforce the delegated powers doctrine and federalism principles that they feared would be obscured or weakened by the inclusion of a Bill of Rights. As for the way judicial review has functioned in a as a structural constraint in American history, suffice it to say that the practice has given the distinguished contemporary political philosopher Jeremy Waldron, a fierce critic of judicial review, plenty of ammunition in making his case around the world against permitting judges to invalidate legislation on constitutional grounds. The federal courts and the federal Supreme Court in particular have had their glory moments, to be sure, such as in the racial desegregation case of Brown against the Board of Education in the 1950s. But they've also handed down decision after decision for Dred Scott against Sanford in the 1850s, which facilitated the expansion of slavery, to Lochner against New York, which struck down worker protection laws, limiting working hours in industrial bakeries, bakeries to 60 hours, in which the justices, by everybody's account, left and right, overstepped the bounds of their authority and unconstitutionally imposed their personal, moral, and political opinions on the entire nation. Now, quite apart from whatever anyone's views happen to be about slavery or worker protection laws or modern issues like abortion or marriage, these decisions are plainly usurpations of the authority of the democratically constituted people to govern themselves. Moreover, since the 1930s, the courts have done really very little indeed, very little, by way of exercising the power of judicial review to support the other constitutional structural restraints on the exercise of governmental power. A very small number of isolated decisions have struck down this or that specific piece of federal legislation as exceeding the delegated powers of the national government or trenching on the reserve powers of the states, but that is about it. Now, uh, this brings me to the critical yet oddly neglected subject of political culture and civic virtue. Uh, a minute ago, I mentioned Professor Waldron. A few years ago, he visited his native New Zealand, not only to warn them against going down the road of the United States and creating judicial review, under uh, adopting a written constitution and empowering courts to enforce it, but to read them the riot act about what he condemned as the abysmal quality of his own nation's parliamentary debate. The bulk of his lecture was devoted to an analysis and critique of a wide range of factors leading to the impoverishment of legislative deliberation, warranting the stinging title he assigned to his lecture, namely parliamentary recklessness. In its penultimate section, entitled Parliamentary Debate, he offers a thoroughly gloomy appraisal. But instead of ending there, offering no grounds for hope, he concluded with a section called The Quality of Public Debate, in which he points to the possibility that the deficiencies of parliamentary debate may be at least partially compensated for by a higher quality of public debate, and even hints that a higher quality of public debate could prompt the reforms necessary to at least 
begin restoring the integrity of parliamentary debate. If you're like me and sometimes you can't sleep at night and you're, 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 you're too tired to do anything with effort like read, but you're still awake, you turn on C-SPAN. And there you see the quality of parliamentary debate. Um, and you probably would be sympathetic to Professor Waldron, uh, who sees the same thing in New Zealand. And he warns, the corruption of parliamentary debate could itself corrupt the political culture at large, driving public debate down to the condition of parliamentary debate, a condition that he describes as follows, and I quote, Parliament becomes a place where the governing party thinks it has won a great victory when debate is closed down and measures are pushed through under urgency, and the social and political forum generally becomes a place where the greatest victory is drowning out your opponent with the noise you can bring to bear. And then the premium is on name calling, on those who bawl the loudest, who can most readily trivialize an opponent's position, who can succeed in embarrassing or shaming or if need be blackmailing into silence anyone who holds a different view, unquote. Does that sound familiar? So in a sense, it is up to people, the people, of New Zealand, the United States, the people of any republic, any liberal democracy as we today say, whether they will rise above the corruption that is demean parliamentary politics or permit it to infect the culture at large. But the people are not some undifferentiated mass. They are people, you and me, individuals. Now, of course, considered as isolated actors, there's not a lot that individuals can do to affect the political culture, but individuals can cooperate for greater effectiveness in prosecuting an agenda of conservation or reform. And they can create associations and institutions that are capable of making a difference, advocacy groups, think tanks like AEI or Brookings or Cato or any of those down in Washington, D.C. or out in the States and the like. A critical element of any discussion of the quality of democratic deliberation and decision making that amounts to anything more than hot air will be the indispensable role of those institutions of civil society, the little platoons yet again, in sustaining a culture in which political institutions do what they're supposed to do, do it reasonably well, and don't do what they are not constitutionally authorized to do. And so we must be mindful that bad behavior on the part of political institutions, which means bad behavior on the part of the people who run those institutions, can weaken, enervate, and even corrupt these institutions of civil society, rendering them for all intents and purposes impotent to resist the bad behavior of the governing class and useless in the cause of political reform. When they're healthy, they can be the engines of political reform. Civil rights movement is a very good example of this. But when they are corrupt, they can't. Now my point, and this is why I promise to return at the end to the importance of the institutions of civil society, is that this is true generally, and it is certainly true with respect to the bad behavior of public officials who betray their obligations to serve by transgressing the bounds of their constitutional authority and the limits embodied in the doctrine of subsidiarity. Constitutional structural constraints are important, yes, but they will be effective, and not just be words on a page. They will be effective only where they are effectually understood and supported by the people, that is, by the political culture. The people need to understand what those structural constraints are. Do you think our people do understand them? And they need to be jealous in their defense. They need to value them at least enough to resist the usurpations by their rulers, even when unconstitutional programs offer immediate gratifications or the relief of urgent problems. This, in turn, requires certain virtues, strengths of character among the people. But these virtues just don't fall down from the heavens on people. They have to be transmitted through the generations and nurtured by each generation. Madison said that only a well-instructed people can be permanently a free people. That's serious political wisdom right there. Only a well-instructed people can be permanently a free people. And he did not mean by that primarily you know, people who are good at math or even understand history uh, or uh, literature. What he fundamentally meant 
is only a people instructed in the principles of Republican government, in the principles of Republican liberty and order, can effectually defend those principles against the usurpations, which are always just over the horizon. It points to the fact that even the best constitutional structures, even the strongest structural constraints on power, aren't worth the paper they are printed on if people don't understand them, value them, and have the will to resist the blandishments of those offering something tempting in return for giving them up or letting violations of them occur without swift and certain political retaliation. But it's also true that virtue is needed. And that's not merely a matter of improving civic education in the schools. The Constitution of the United States was famously defended by Madison in Federalist Paper Number 51 as, and I quote, supplying by opposite and rival interests the defect of better motives, unquote. In other words, by structuring the interests so that people acting on their interests and not necessarily out of good motives or virtuous motives will still end up with a good result. Now, he made this point immediately after observing that the first task of government is to control the governed, and the second is to control itself. He allowed that, quote, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions, unquote. Hence, the auxiliary precautions, those constitutional structural constraints. But even in this formulation, notice that they are auxiliary, secondary, not primary. What's primary? The understanding and virtue of the people. And we can't do without it. That dependence on the people is a permanent condition to keep the rulers in line. But that brings us back to the role and importance of virtue. John Adams understood as well as anyone the general theory of the Constitution. He was the ablest scholar and political theorist of the founding generation. And when I say that, everybody gets upset because, well, no, 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 no. Adams, you know, he was, it was Jefferson or it was Hamilton. No, they were smart. They were good guys. And they knew a lot about civics. But when it comes to the actual understanding of political theory in the broader tradition, you know, Adams was unparalleled. Um, now, Adams himself could account for why he wasn't given the credit he deserved uh, when when, um, when he was originally tapped to write the Declaration of Independence, he said, no, 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 give it to Jefferson. Uh, and he explained that, uh, you know, we want this thing to work. We want the people to accept it. And you, Jefferson, are tall and personable. I am short and obnoxious. Uh, all four of those were actually true. <laughs> and were pretty good reasons for uh, uh, for letting Jefferson uh, you know, do the job and get the credit. Uh, and yet, uh, when it comes to scholarship, uh, Adams was uh, really quite a remarkable person. And he certainly got the point about supplying the defect of better motives. Yet he also understood that the health of the political culture was an indispensable element of the success of the constitutional enterprise, an enterprise of ensuring that the rulers stay within the bounds of their legitimate authority, indeed be servants of the common good, servants of the people they rule. He remarked famously, infamously in some circles, that our Constitution is made for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Our government is for a, our Constitution is for a moral and religious people. Why? It's because a people lacking in virtue could be counted on to trade liberty for protection, for financial or personal security, for comfort, for being looked after, for being taken care of, for having their problems solved quickly. And there will always be, and all the American founders understood that there will always be, and any sensible person understands that there will always be people occupying or standing for public office who will be happy to offer the people the deal, an expansion of their power in return for what they can offer by virtue of that expansion. So the question then is how to form people fitted out with the virtues to make them worthy of Republican 
liberty and capable of preserving constitutionally limited government in the face of strong temptations which will inevitably come to compromise it away. And here we see the central role and significance, I believe, of the most basic institution of civil society or institutions of civil society, the family, the religious community, private organizations of all types that are devoted to the inculcation of knowledge and virtue, private, very often religiously based educational institutions like Villanova. These are the institutions that are in the business of transmitting knowledge and virtue and do it better than government can, in part for a reason that the ancient Greek philosophers understood very well. Your, the folks in your family know your name. Un, un, unless you're one of a, a, a small number of people, the general government doesn't know your name. They don't know your particular needs, your strengths, your weaknesses, your sensitivities. Mm. I, I'm going to guess some of you are parents and grandparents. You notice even in your own family how different two kids can be from each other, how different their needs, sensibilities, opportunities, talents, strengths, weaknesses are. If you're going to inculcate knowledge and virtue, you have to have some knowledge of the individual to whom you are trying to transmit these things. These institutions are indeed, as is often said, especially by uh, Marianne Glendon of Harvard, mediating institutions that provide a buffer between the individual and the power of the central state. It's ultimately the autonomy, integrity, and general flourishing of these institutions that will determine the fate of limited constitutional government. And this is not only because of their primary and indispensable role in transmitting virtues, it's also because their performance of health, education, and welfare functions is the only real alternative to the removal of these functions to, quote, larger and higher associations, that is, to government, and ultimately to central government, the government furthest away and least responsive and accountable to the people. When government expands to play the primary role in performing these functions, the ideal of limited government is soon lost. No matter the formal structural constraints of the Constitution, they become just words on a page. And the corresponding weakening of the status and authority of these institutions damages their ability to perform all their functions, including their moral and pedagogical ones. With that, they surely lose their capacity to influence for the good the political culture, which at the end of the day is the whole shooting match when it comes to whether the ruler can truly be a servant. Thank you for your exemplary patience. That was a long and dry lecture. <laughs>